Good morning or good afternoon. It's Harry from Trek It and I'm joined by my co-star Kaylee, also from Trek It. And you may notice to my right or your left, I'm also joined by Mr. Bob Thomas from Contour Outdoor. And the theme of uh, today's video is basically we found a load of advice online, many of which is not correct or is just um, lacking context. And we thought we would get Bob to uh, basically answer them and hopefully offer the correct advice. So. Would you like to give us a background of you, um, what you do, anything else that you might think is relevant to the viewers? Okay, well, first of all, thanks for the uh, introduction there, Harry. Uh, my name's Bob Thomas. Uh, I'm a qualified uh, mountaineering and climbing instructor, and I hasten to add, that's for summer conditions only. However, I've got quite a lot of uh, uh, experience in climbing in uh, winter as well, although I don't instruct uh, in winter. Um, my background is, uh, I've been doing this now for in excess of 20 years. As part of that, I've basically qualified as a mountaineer and climbing instructor. So I feel, in some respects, when we go through, uh, after the intro, when we go through some of the questions that Harry's got, where I can land advice, I'll lend it, and where, shall I say, I need to defer, uh, we'll defer, but we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Is that okay, Harry? Perfect. Excellent. So, the first question, I should add that most of these have been sort of scoured from various depths of the internet, so some are from Facebook, some are from forums, we've rephrased them and we're not listing any names, we don't want to um, uh, offend anyone. So the first post is, I'm going to the Brecon Beacon soon, and I've put a little edit in here, in the middle of winter, predicted snow and minus conditions at the time, would trainers be okay? The first reply was, trainers are fine, full stop. Well, uh, I think the key thing there is what's the context? Now, normally, you know, uh, I go up the beacons a lot. Penafan is my, um, one of my stamping grounds. And do I see people in trainers? Yeah, you know, they're people that know what they're doing. They're fell runners. They, they appear to have the, the right kit uh, and they're wearing trainers. Uh, what I hasten to add though, usually when I see them doing this, it's, um, uh, you know, should we say there's no snow on the ground? Now, would I advise going up the Penafan? with predicted snow in minus conditions in trainers if you're just walking? The answer is no, of course not. Um, your feet are gonna get cold very quickly. They're gonna get wet very, very quickly. And dare I say, what people um, underestimate is the difference between the temperature when they start at a place, a typical starting place like the Story Arms and the summit of the Penafan itself. So on this one here, I'd say, and the key thing here, and we'll see later on, what's the context, the middle of winter, predicted snow uh, and minus conditions with regard temperature, not in a million years. Certainly, I'd have my boots on, a good set of socks, good set of insoles, uh, as well as, obviously, clothed and my pack packed uh, uh, in a, such a way that it's appropriate to the conditions. Okay, so the next bit is, it's okay to drink from here, as there aren't any houses upstream. <laughs> Once again, what's the context? Where are you? You know, I've heard that phrase say, be saying when we're next to a well in Morocco and the locals are drinking from it. I totally understand that. Um, Is that something you've heard before? You've heard people say that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look, look, there aren't any houses or should we say that there isn't any human habitation, there's nothing cut stream? Right. Well, how do you know? Um, personally, uh, I always take purification tablets. I know that people absolutely, you know, you loathe them or you know you can tolerate them. Uh, with myself, they do with the Puri tabs. I think made by Life Venture, which track it stop. Yeah. Uh, you do get a another tablet which acts as to neutralise an agent to the um, uh, the chlorine that actually acts as the purification. I hasten to add with that though, when I am purifying, I still try and filter it through because sometimes those Puri tabs they don't kill if you've got massive clumps of mud in the water. Mm -hmm. If you're taking perhaps from a stream and the stream bed's been disturbed. Um, gold standard for me is either I boil it or what I'm actually using is some form of filtration system. Okay. And they all have their advantages and disadvantages. For me, I don't mind the purification tablets. Mm. Um, I understand how some people actually find the taste of the water quite repulsive. Um, I don't mind it and from, from, from my own personal point of view, that's the lightest. Yeah. And dare I say it, uh, I think our water more tastes like that at home. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you should be, what, with the chlorine? Yeah. Wow, good yeah. girl. Perhaps you should be using some sort of catadine filter. Maybe, or I do use a filter at home. There you go. Yeah. But um, 
Any houses upstream, yeah, you don't know if there's livestock or how can I say, you know, there's some other form of contamination. Yeah. That's I was going to say that. Everyone seems to, everyone I speak to seems to have been told a story by their parents that there could be a dead sheep upstream. As yeah. if there are just there multitudes is, yeah. of dead sheep in, in streams, they always just seem to <laughs> die yeah. conveniently there. Yeah. But it's true, you um, you don't know what is in the stream. And even if there isn't a house, it doesn't mean there couldn't be some other repulsive thing. Well, there is other waterborne, um, should we say, uh, hazards that, such as uh, cryptosporidium and things yeah. like that, that you need to guard yourself against. Why do I need three pairs of gloves when I only have one pair of hands? Now we did a video with Paul about this uh, a while ago and it was titled something like how to layer gloves. Um, that's why you should have a few pair of gloves really because there are some for different circumstances and also like clothing they can be layered. Uh, what's what's your sort of go-to when you're out, let's say you're out in the mountains in winter, how many pairs of gloves would you typically take? I know it's quite a vague one. Yeah, but th three, up to yeah. four sets of gloves, and in a touch glove, uh, perhaps a sort of merino wool. These days, again, if I go back to sort of mobile phone, um, with the, the sort of little, should we say, uh, uh, little fingerprint things on the end. Finger fingerprints yeah. that, that allow you to use your, your phone if you have to in an emergency, or dare I say it, for navigation purposes. So I always like a thin set of touch gloves. Goes back from a day, say, climbing in Norway, not touching metal with bare flesh, or because um, you don't want your hands to stick to it. Mm. Um, and again, it's that little layer that wards off the cold. And then it can largely depends on what I'm doing, whether I take, you know, mittens, all gloves both have their advantages and disadvantages but uh, dare I say you know Scotland winter mountaineering where there's a chance that your gloves get wet yeah. then it's that ability to put a spare set of gloves on uh, whilst trying to dry the other gloves say under your armpits or keeping them close to your body but the more sets of gloves that you can carry yeah, you know uh, up to three sets probably I'll carry uh, the better. And again, the, what they're made from largely depends on what I'm doing. Uh, many years ago, um, you know, I, I sort of, on advice that I had from when I was mountaineering in Canada, most of the guides there that were operating in, you know, dry, cold temperature, they'd steered away from th synthetic and went to uh, a leather glove or a leather mitten. Uh, and that's a kind of what I try to do. Mm. Um, but, you know, gloves, mittens, as many sets as possible, and have a, it's not just thinking about the gloves, it's having a system to dry them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, we keep banging on about this context thing, but it's my, my sort of system will be completely different to a lot of people's, because typically I'll have the cameras with me. And so like yeah. my go-to is to have like a, a liner for, you know, for the ups, if you're going up the mountains, yeah. especially where you can get hot, but you don't overheat your hands. And then when I get on the top, I've got like um, like a pair of windproof leather, fairly uninsulated, but just something to keep the keep the most of the weather off. Yeah, those are perfect for using a camera. And then you've got your insulated glove to add all the warmth if your hands do get you know slightly yeah. chilly. Slightly going off on the tangent, you know, we said about sort of gloves. It's like clothing as well. Often that I see people say in the car park while they're getting ready on a cold day to sort themselves out. You know, it might be that I've got a bigger set of gloves that aren't really practical for use on the hill mm. or uh, perhaps an older set of gloves and I'll be wearing them in the car or for use in the car. Perhaps I have to put snow chains off, take, um, put snow chains on, take snow chains off. And that means that the gloves that I'm going to take on the hill aren't wet before yeah. I've started. And it kind of goes the same with jackets. I've got an old set of jacket and an old set of waterproof bottoms that I can use in that kind of situation. Perhaps I've got to dig the car out you know, with the, with the snow, a bit of build up the snow, put snow chains on, or just sort of general administration before I head off. I've got that big jacket that might be impractical to wear on the hills, that big chunky set of gloves that aren't my favourite anymore from the hills, and that's kind of what I use. Then ditch them in the car, meaning that I've got three sets and my warm jacket ready to go, and I'm not having to go into a pack to get my stuff out as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next post is, I'm new to using a map and compass and wondered if there were any courses I could take local to disclosed location. The first reply was, why bother when you can get all of it on your phone? So I've put this in here because again, it's a very sort of dismissive reply. Um, mm. Someone has asked for help and we don't know <laughs> anything about them and someone has just said, Trolled. don't bother. Yeah. 
So yeah. I think trolls the right yeah. uh, reply to what yeah. you say there, Kaylee. This is but the problem with asking technical questions, especially on online, Facebook, is yeah. that you've got some people are really, really good they at just offering love it all day. amazing advice, and others are just useless. Mm. I think you know. First of all, a bit of a plug here. Uh, yeah. My own uh, uh, company, Contour Outdoor, we run navigational courses for the beginner right up to the advanced. Uh, from simple one to two day courses right up to five day courses that will equip you with the navigational skills that will enable you to move safely uh, or assist you moving safely uh, in the mountains. Now going back to the question where it says why bother when you can, you've got all of it on your phone, I think you only have to look at uh, instances reported on websites like Gruff for example which highlights you know mountain rescue sort of instances in the UK that Perhaps it's a combination of lockdown, but what we're seeing is, or what has been observed, is there's an increasing amount of people venturing into the outdoors. Nothing wrong with that. They're, you know, people are, how can we say, they're getting to understand the benefits uh, for physical as well, or mental welfare of going in the outdoors. But sadly, some aren't putting the right, should we say, building blocks in place, and insofar as that they're relying on the good old phone for the navigation. Now, on one of my courses, you know, we actually we teach how to use your phone, uh, should we say, safely and effectively. Um, but what I'd say with using the phone is that, you know, it's an aid to navigation. Yeah, definitely. It's not navigation in itself. And just being able to look at a screen with a dot to tell you where the location is, you actually need to, to understand what the screen's telling you insofar as the contour lines, the various conventional symbols, and how that, how that will impact on your travel. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's an aid to navigation. Just like when GPS came out, say, when people started using handsets about 20, 15 to 20 years ago when they became more commercially available. Again, we kind of, in the outdoor world, you saw the same situation where people were purely relying on the fact that they could be given a location. But they, again, if we go back to that word context, they didn't understand what the location uh, they didn't understand the location, how it was relative to the sort of the context on on the on the screen. Ultimately, what I what I teach is that you know you've got your basic skills, map and compass. That thing that if the phone goes wrong, if you break it, uh, you know the, uh, by meaning going wrong, you know you've lost your charge in the phone. You've got something to fall back on. Mm. But this isn't an evil thing, you know, just as GPS isn't an evil thing to navigate with. You know, there are instances where poor weather conditions, light, uh, you can magnify the screen. You know, I wear glasses, I've smashed my glasses. I have the ability to, you know, make the screen bigger mm. uh, and, um, you know, gather the relevant data to assist my navigation there. So next one. Any advice when purchasing crampons? I have some Scarpa Rebel light boots and wouldn't mind purchasing second hand. Reply, don't bother. We don't get any snow of descent, spelt wrong, condition, decent condition. What's your thoughts on that, Bob? The thoughts on that is that um, we've got somebody here that's asking advice, so probably aren't tuned in, shall we say, to uh, the intricacies of how you match a crampon to a boot and the compatibility of boots to crampons. Now, without going too far into this, um, you have a B rating for boots and you have a C rating for crampons. And you need to marry those two up to ensure that the crampon fits the boot correctly. Uh, Favourite phrase, if there is doubt, then there is doubt. Uh, my advice would be ring up the Trekit service centre, ask their advice on the Scarpa Rebel light boot, which if my memory serves me correctly is I think up to a C2 rating for the boot. However, just ring up the uh, service centre and seek their advice. With regard to purchasing equipment second hand, I don't really have a, a problem with things like clothing, if it works for me, to a certain extent tents. Um, should we say the softer side of equipment? What I do have a problem with these days is uh, purchasing, should we say, the hardware, carabiners, should we say, ropes. Where you need to kind of know the history of it. Yeah, the provenance yeah. of it, you know, what it's been used for. Um, and that's where my, the, uh, the problem for me lies. Yeah. Uh, there, are, and there are anecdotal stories going out at the moment uh, about, um, should we say, forgeries online. There have been instances with, so we say, China, and although we're sort of 
not going down too much of a rabbit hole here, but with ropes, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, this is fact. This is not, you know, uh, anecdotal. Where mar ropes have been marked up, manufactured in China, um, said that they're suitable for climbing purposes. Uh, they've been tested by the UIAA. Uh, that's you know the governing body uh, for mountaineering sort of worldwide uh, and they failed the tests and they basically found out that these things marked up as a climb rope and they're not yeah. and I guess that's the danger that you say with a crampon you know the abuse that it's had uh, is it actually you know a genuine crampon and again if there's doubt in your mind and you're buying it you're investing actually quite a lot of money yeah. plus if the thing goes wrong and falls off that foot you know, it's, it's your life we're talking about here. And it sort of goes back to the whole context thing that we were talking about earlier. I mean, the original post doesn't give you a whole lot of context, no. but if they're looking for a crampon, they obviously are going somewhere that has a decent amount of snow. And it might not even be in this country, but the reply just sort of dismisses it altogether yeah. and just assumes that they're in the UK and they might just be going up their local hill. Yeah, if they're crampons. dog walking or something in the snow, then perhaps <laughs> yeah. that's fine, purchasing secondhand. But if it's something of a safety matter, yeah. yeah. And again, you know, with the advice, any advice on purchasing crampons, and again, the context is a great one, because you might not actually need crampons, it's micro spikes yeah. that you need. Um, again, what's the context? Yeah. Exactly. Talk to us. Get in contact on one of the corners. <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed all of our uh, all the posts we found. We have it took me a long time to find these. There's lots and lots of really really good advice out there, and there's loads of good websites. Um, there's loads of good places to find valuable information. Uh, these are just a selection of ones that probably aren't um, aren't correct. But uh, yeah, you've got a few places that you go, don't you? For, for yeah, British Mountaineering right? Council. Mm. You know, um, sometimes. It's just going to the manufacturer. You know, one of the best bits of advice I got given on my um, kit inspection course was read the instructions. Mm. Yeah. You know, this is all right, applicable to climbing equipment, but how many times do we pick out that stove uh, and we're so eager to use that stove, we don't uh, read the instructions? Or do, dare I go back to it, we buy a lovely waterproof and um, we fail to read the little tab on the inside that says, treat at least once a month. So, you know, the information's out there. Yeah. But I think it's fair to say, Harry, that if anybody gets to that sort of dead end with the information, they can always ring yourselves, can't they? Absolutely, yeah. So we've got a whole customer service team that are on hand uh, Monday to Friday. You can ask them whatever outdoor question you want, whether it's about kit or just general advice, um, you can find the link in one of these corners again and in the description. Um, so that's, yeah, that's pretty much all from me. Yeah, and if they, they don't know the answer, they at least have avenues to, to find the answer for mm. you, so they can always come back to you, um, and they'd be happy to do that. They're lovely. They're a good bunch. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed watching this today. Special thanks to, to Bob for joining Not us as well. Thank you very much. It's been really nice, and we've had two cups of tea, so we've done well. Yeah, full of caffeine. Yeah. yeah, full of caffeine, as you can guess. And if you want to book a course with Bob, yeah, you've uh, got a very good website. Yeah, at contouroutdoor.co.uk. We run a full uh, series of courses ranging from walking through to scrambling through to uh, climbing and mountaineering, predominantly in uh, South, North Wales and up to the Isle of Skye. There we go. There you are. Yeah, got any questions? Ask us or book Bob. Yeah. <laughs> All the best now. Thank Catch you very later. much. Bye.